Matthew, welcome to the uh, New York Information Security Meetup podcast. And uh, it's, it's really a great pleasure to have you. Um, you've done so much. And, you know, I find that, uh, you know, I had to kind of do some research about you. And, and it's amazing because you have quite, quite a lot of content online, uh, but not in the form of a video, which I think it's much more personal and, and provide ability for people to see who you are, not just outside of the nuts and bolts of cybersecurity, but just get a feel total, you know, overall about your story and, and your, you know, kind of your journey. And I would love to, to start with that, with your, with your permission. Uh, and then we'll jump into where you are in the world and how you're actually connected to this, this conversation today. Matthew, thanks for, thanks for joining. Yeah, absolutely. Good morning. And sure, let's, uh, we'll, we'll see, <laughs> we'll see how we'll the see conversation goes. goes. But uh, anyway, we're, we're, uh, I'll give you a cheers to some coffee this morning. <laughs> I'm having my own uh, double shot espresso. So nice. How did you get started in, in cybersecurity and became a prominent senior uh, authority in, in the space? Wow, gosh, um, it was a mistake. Um, I was working in a software development role for a 3D animation company. Uh, I decided that I wanted to become an MCSE. Uh, and found a, a job with a small company called Coal Fire at the time. I think less than $2 million of revenue. Um, and I had that job and I had a job at Chili's. Uh, and I had interviewed for those back to back. And I had been, I, I think I had, it took me a long time to find a job after, after I graduated. Um, and uh, yeah, luckily Coal Fire gave me the job. And so I started building, um, endpoints for pen testers and then quickly transitioned into a pen test role because I was helping them doing debugging and of course in a small consulting firm like that a billable resource is better than one that's uh, sitting on your SGNA and so yeah so that was my first transition was uh, into quick you know quick pen question testing. for you so w what would you say you know the things that that made you you know made you uh, attractive to them at the time did you tell them that you're applying for two jobs simultaneously and one is Chili's or, or was it, you kept that a secret? What, what was that they saw in you specifically because you had no experience, right? Cause a lot of people are struggling with that piece to, to get that first role. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think it was, look, they were hiring me for an entry level, um, help desk role. Right. So I wasn't, I wasn't entering cybersecurity actually. Right. Um, I was entering IT, uh, leaving development, entering core IT help desk in order to um, become an MCSE and get my CCNA next. And so then the transition was a natural transition and I started to watch these guys um, participate in, you know, really interesting engagements with uh, banks and other things and that at the time I was 20 years old and the idea that I could be handing a bank manager uh, his password was just, I was flabbergasted. I just thought to myself, this is crazy. Like, how can we be so insecure? And it wasn't one bank, it was bank after bank after bank after bank. Um, so maybe it was power. Maybe, maybe that's what I was attracted to at first was just this like immediate access to huge swaths of information um, and power. I don't know. Maybe that was it. And and do you think that they, the fact that you, basically were not picky about what, you know, what to get. So you basically said, okay, I'm going to just get into this field, regardless, you know, and I'll start doing something. Uh, and as you mentioned, you weren't too picky about what was that something would be. And also, you know, you did a computer electrical engineering, which is which is a very um, you know, very top heavy on, on the, on the STEM and uh, mathematics side, which is not easy as well. Right. So kind of you, you kind of glass over that. Yeah, I, I did. I graduated with a computer electrical engineering degree and then I had a certificate in embedded systems. So, um, I, I thought I was going to be the next chip designer for Intel. Um, but I come from a, a blue collar family. I'm a first generation, um, uh, scholar in terms of college grad and um, nobody was offering perspective that they're not going to hire you out of uh, your undergrad degree to go design chips at Intel. 
Um, so, you know, it was a rude awakening for me to sort of get that reality check. And, um, but, but you're right. I had in, in the course of my, uh, college career had uh, designed, um, circuits and built robots and even written my own version of a TCP IP stack, um, uh, for real time embedded systems. Um, well, was it more so, efficient? Yeah, so, or did you have to rewrite it? You know, because they make you do weird stuff. I mean, we also wrote a programming language in a pragmatic programming language course. So, like, not because we needed another programming language, but just because it's to teach you the fundamentals. So, yeah. And do you think that since you have such a, relatively speaking, deep understanding in the underlying nuts and bolts of, of computing, do you think that helped you propel your career further? Like, just because you have that kind of base the baseline of the not a lot of, be honest with you, not a lot of CISOs today have, have that kind of technical training. And it, it, I'm not saying it's good or bad, you know, people, you know, come from all walks of life. And I think it's, we need that diversity, but you in particular have a very unique skill set that I have not come across yet. I think, um, I think the tech, I, I'm in this constant battle. I mean, you can even see it in my resume today. Uh, I wrote a book about business knowledge. And if you look at my, my recent sort of academic pursuits, if you will, it's AWS, Azure, and Kubernetes certification. So I'm constantly tugged in two directions. On one hand, how do I be a better executive and a better uh, leader? And on the other hand, uh, I like to tinker. And I, I still think one of my funnest roles in my entire career was just the pen test lead role, just breaking stuff was so much fun. Breaking stuff is, is way more fun than building um, in a lot of ways because you don't even have to be an expert. There's not really a lot of pressure. You don't have, you know, uh, uptime requirements. There's, it, it was just a lot, there was a lot less stress and a lot more um, adrenaline in, in that role. So, yeah, for sure. We should uh, design a shirt, uh, never stop tinkering. You know, so even if you get, you yeah. get to uh, <laughs> a management role, you still the fact that you have that curiosity and you know that that need to, to break stuff because that's fundamentally what we're trying to do is we're trying to as, as cybersecurity professionals we're trying to you know protect uh, you know from from our systems to be broken and the only way you can you can effectively do that if you know how how to break stuff. So I think that you have to have the ability to, to see both sides of, of the fence. Um, it, it's so interesting as well is that uh, you mentioned that you you felt the thrill of of breaking stuff, but pen testing in particular, there's a lot of empty hours where you try, try, try until mm -hmm. you you come ac across a glimpse of maybe like a, a thread when you start pulling and start figuring out. What in particular did you enjoy while you, you know you did that? And do you remember like the first couple of incidents where you managed to uncover vulnerabilities or managed to break into systems? Well, I, yeah, I, I mean, early on, probably the first thing was just the basic scanners, right? So you're running an Nmap and a maybe a I think it was still early days when I started. I forget when Rapid Seven was founded, but I remember working with their team to to unravel a, like a timing bug in their, in their software at some point. So I, I remember the, the scan results and the vulnerability testing. And early on, it was about just validating that the, the results were valid. And that gradually led you to understand sort of what are the technology stacks that will frequently have flaws. And it gave you an intuitive approach to, okay, well, you know, if I see a PHP stack, and then sitting next to it at the same company is, um, you know, something on .NET. I'm going to start with the PHP stack because there's way more likelihood that I'm going to pop something on this box, and then maybe I can uh, pivot in to something that's proximate in in the DMZ or something like that. So I don't know. I, I remember MSO 4060 as the first shell uh, popping that with the early early versions of Metasploit, and I remember thinking that HD Moore was a god. Um, yeah, I think I, I'm just, I haven't thought about this in forever. Um, I remember, I definitely remember some of the first web exploits because 
uh, that was a, a completely different skill set for me going to up the stack. If you think about it, I was very familiar and comfortable with um, the infrastructure layer stuff. And so tr the trans translation into some of the app layer was interesting. Um, and even early on, uh, I, when I when I came to when I went to Coal Fire, my adjustment was from a .NET programming role at a, a 3D animation company, and so I ended up taking that uh, entire knowledge base and um, uh, the MSDN uh, subscriptions were were available, so I could get download the .NET development tools, and I wrote my own custom. Um, fuzzer for, for a .NET app for a, 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 a payments, uh, um, I forget what they're called, but payments, uh, it was for IP commerce back in the day. And we ended up, um, what did we do with that thing? We, we, we ended up just testing some API endpoints, which at the time, you know, ages ago, the, the front end of microservices, I think they called it service-oriented architecture back then. Um, yeah, so... I remember bits and pieces, glimpses, but it's been 20 years or more. Gosh, uh, no, nah, it hasn't been do quite 20 years, but almost that. Do you do you miss those days? Like, do you ever, you know, think, okay, because you you could have taken that path as well. You could have continued becoming, you know, potentially just uh, maybe leading, uh, you know, specifically like software tools to to break into stuff or design, you know, additional components because there, there's there's a lot of demand there as well. I think, you know, I don't see it as all that different, and here's why. Um, along the way, uh, at some point, I, you know, right before, I'm going to say before Jobs died, he talked about um, giving inputs to systems and seeing what they are as outputs. And the idea was um, that, that you have this black box of a system. So if the black box is a .NET app or a PHP app or a server or a department or an organization, it doesn't matter. You give an input and it elicits a response and you can see what you can do with that response. And sometimes you can manipulate the inputs in order to get an output in a, in, in a different way. So if you think about all of the things that we wrote about in the book, um, it's really in, in a lot of ways fundamentally tied to that mindset. If I present to the board in a particular way, I can be aware of my intent, and my intent might be to elicit a particular feeling in a particular board member. Or if I uh, talk to somebody who I need to take action on a particular remediation, there's a couple of different ways that I can uh, think about influencing them. I can use uh, peer pressure, I can use um, individual motivation, I can think about leveraging organizational structure in order to put pressure on them from a um, even from uh, talking to their manager and getting uh, bits and pieces of security output uh, structured into their bonus, for example. So there's lots of, you know, there's input, black box, output, and then you manipulate the inputs to see what you get out. It's, it's the same as, uh, uh, you know, um, manipulating an, in, an XML injection into a website. It's the same thing. So I love I love the, uh, the analogy. In you know, you've, you've fulfilled different roles uh, as, as a consultant, as, you know, a services manager. You were, you have such a round uh, experience. Um, you were, again, you were at the kind of the service provider, the, you know, the kind of the vendor side, but you were also a large enterprise and you fulfilled several roles. Does that make you today, uh, you know, more aware of, of the overall industry in terms of how, um, you know, how the whole cybersecurity industry, because there's a lot of areas within the cybersecurity today where um, some a little bit of contention, right? So you have kind of the vendors versus quote unquote, the enterprise. Mm -hmm. And you hear a lot of people on the kind of the different social media, how they, you know, kind of bitch and complain uh, about mm -hmm. that relationship and how it's, it's, you know, there's, there's a lot to be said about that. What's your take on it in terms of like, you know, there are 3000 plus vendors, uh, very prolific from a, you know, from a kind of uh, development of new, you know, shiny tools perspective, but, but yet we're still, uh, you know, in a lot of ways, we're not, you know, as, as, as far ahead as we want it to be from a, from a risk protection perspective. Well, look, uh, there's an enormous economic opportunity. Cyber valuations are huge. Um, 
the world is becoming more digital. 60 or 70 percent of GDP uh, going forward will be built on the backs of digital platforms. So uh, that's a world economic, somewhere in there, 60 or 70, it's a World Economics Forum uh, metric from uh, about a year ago. So, so you've got people that are pursuing economic opportunities, and I'm not going to be upset about that. I mean, I want my son to uh, be aware of where the tide is flowing and um, position himself in an industry that's thriving, not in an industry that's dying. So I'm not going to raise him and say, hey, you should become a steel mill uh, operator because that doesn't make sense. So no, I don't really feel that. Um, I do feel like my paces on the vendor side help me empathize with um, trying to crack open the door and it's only gotten more difficult. Like you mentioned, the vendor landscape has exploded and so it's not one MDR vendor, it's 15 that are trying to get in the door. And that's true for every, you know, independent category. Um, so I, I, I see the world a lot different than some of the other guys. And, you know, it's also true. I'm not, uh, I mean, LogicWorks has got a fantastic story and an amazing growth trajectory and, and all of that, but I'm not um, sitting in the role where I'm, you know, the chief of a uh, Fortune 10 company. So the the outreach and my experience is maybe a little bit different in terms of the volume of activity because um, everybody knows you make your quota for the year if you can get a whatever product sold to the Bank of America or to whatever at scale. I mean, certainly they do POCs and smaller, you know, they, they dabble in other areas and such. But um, so I think... I, I think I just have a lot more empathy for vendors. The other thing is, look, my program is not successful without my vendors. It's not, and I want to see them succeed. And um, and I have peers who are trying to do a lot of the same things that I do. And I want to share uh, the successes that we have. So my VRM tool or my um, endpoint or the SOC team that I've uh, managed to outsource to or my third party risk program or my auditors or any of it. If I'm having a great experience um, to the extent that I can, I want to promote them because I want them to be successful. And the more cash that they have, the more innovation that they're going to bring back to me. Um, and, and then the last piece is I like to sit in a, a position of influence with my vendors if I can, which is why you see um, that I sit on a number of advisory board uh, roles and have um, not always gone to the largest vendors in the marketplace, but gone to vendors who I think have a lot of promise and who are willing to be um, responsive to to the needs that we have as an organization. So, And Matt, I have so many questions. I'm trying to keep it all in order because every time you, you say something, <laughs> there's, there's, there's more threads I'd like to pull. Um, specifically, you know, you mentioned that, that you, you feel empathy with the vendors. What can they do if there was a couple things they can do today to to really kind of break through that noise, as you mentioned, and become more successful. And again, you have the unique view to be on the inside as well as on the outside, both sides of the fence, which, which is very unique. Um, what would that be? What would you recommend to, to some of these vendors? And I'm assuming you do some of that to, to, the, um, to the companies you advise today. I think um, Clayton Christensen, who talks about the um, innovator's dilemma, he wrote How to Measure Your Life and a couple of other things that, you know, rest in peace. Um, he uh, He's had a really big influence on the way that I see things and the way that I think about things. And um, one of the things that he talks about is a job to be done, right? So I'm not out buying a... Um, I'm not out buying a right, pick, pick your pick, whatever the solution is, a, an email filtering tool. That's not what I'm trying to do, right? I didn't wake up and be like, well, hey, I need to buy one of these. That's not, that's not the case. I, I, I set out to achieve a particular goal. And so I think um, instead of getting into these meetings and telling me about the, the kill chain for the 700th time, like I have never heard the kill chain before, um, really spend some time understanding what it is that I'm about and what I'm trying to do. And you need to come up with more interesting questions than what keeps you up at night, right? If you're going to sell me an email tool, 
I understand that you have a hammer and you're looking for nails. Um, but at the same time, I think if you can broaden the context of your conversation, then you have a lot more success. Um, and that's what we did a lot of times at Fishnet. Uh, I, I was in there for the purposes of supporting services. And oftentimes we, you know, a lot of the, we, we had a, something like a hundred different sales reps and I supported between four and 10 at any given time. And so I would sort of baseline and compare performance across all of them. And some of them sold only services and some of them sold only uh, technology. And at that time it was mostly sling in boxes because the cloud didn't, wasn't really a thing, right? Um, and we would go into conversations to sell a firewall and we would walk out with three services engagements by just asking questions. Um, hey, help me understand, why are you doing this? How does this connect to your business outcomes? What specifically does this mean? Um, <laughs> the other thing that became apparent, which is why we wrote the book, is uh, a lot of the CISOs had no idea what business context, like they, they just couldn't answer the questions. They just, they didn't know. They, they couldn't tie to a meaningful IT metric. They couldn't tie to a meaningful uh, business outcome. And so, um, there's a great book called Let's Get Real or Let's Not Play, and it talks about aligning uh, value systems in order to get to uh, the same outcome. So all buyers and sellers want efficient outcomes that exactly meet the buyer's needs. They all do. And so if you put yourself on the same table as I'm here to get an efficient deal that meets your needs exactly, and it's perfectly okay for me to not have the solution that you want, then, um, then, then this sort of like pressure that I'm gonna force you in a box or make you be in a corner dissipates and you can have much more psychological air and you have a, a much more uh, relaxed, open, um, functional dialogue with a, with a person who's actually trying to help you. Um, and I, I know you see that in people, they say mostly salespeople will say things like they're helping whatever they're helping and most, most of the time. Um, that's not true because they've also got somebody behind them saying, hey, uh, your quota, your pipeline is light, your quota is uh, upside down, um, so let's go, let's get the, you know, let's get the move on. So, I don't know, let's get yeah. real or let's not play is a super, super transformative book for me in terms of the buyer-seller relationship, and it was so that I could sell services to CISOs, um, but it's um, it's had a big impact on me. And, and I think that a lot of CISOs have their guards up. Um, again, if you hear a question, like I said, uh, you know, what keeps you up at night, I think you immediately clam up in a shell because, because yeah, it's man. just, um, you know, so you have to learn how to ask these questions, but again, I think that the, uh, that's why a lot of the salespeople are lacking is that they don't get enough. I don't, first of all, I don't think they make the investment in uh, really understanding and reading books like your, like the one you wrote, for example, and we'll touch upon that as well. So this is a good segue. Uh, they don't make the investment personally and therefore uh, they're not getting trained enough to be, to ask these, these type of intelligent questions that shows that you are a real partner or a potential partner you know, it's part of the engagement. You're just asking like the, you know, the regular questions and you start asking, okay, what's your budget? What's your timeline? You hmm. know, who's responsible and so on. And then, and at that point, um, I think you clam up as a, as a CISO or as a, as a director of security, um, you clam up and you don't, you don't share that. Um, so this is a good segue. So you uh, go ahead. I'd love to, I I'd just love to say this. So I was a technical support person in a sales capacity. That's what I was, right? I was a sales engineer effectively um, on services. And I'd like to challenge the solutions engineers to do the qualification questions because they have the street cred. Don't force your rep to ask those hard, when is this due, do you have a budget, you know, the band, the, the, the qualification. Have your technical person do it in the dialogue during their technical discovery. And I think you have a less um, armed person. If you're, if you're in the middle of a, an architecture session and you're talking about things and you say, hey, um, I need to understand what kind of budget you have because it's gonna help us steer whether we pick Palo Alto Prisma Access or we pick a couple of VMs that we're gonna short term get you uh, licensed up on. The difference could be you know, between 30 grand and 80 grand or something on, on this particular solution. Um, but that's a totally different qualification, like 
a feel from a, you know, you're in the midst of solving an actual problem and you need this information, not because it's going to tell you whether you can forecast properly, uh, uh, whether you're going to close this deal by the end of the quarter and how much money it's going to put in your pocket, but instead because it's going to help you design a meaningful solution that ties exactly to the business outcome, which is it's got to be in the budget. So I think, um, I don't know, I think that sales engineers could stand a little taller um, and stop shying away from the commercial conversations. Yeah, and they always say, oh, I'm like, you know, I'm not, I'm not, you know, I'm not the sales. I'm like the sales engineer. Um, yeah. So what's the value of, of, of even having salespeople? I mean, it seems like a lot of times today, a lot of it, the stuff is, is, is inbound, right? So by the time that somebody reaches out to you, they're already like halfway through the, the purchasing process. They already made the research, you know, they kind of know what they want and so on. And, and, and so what happens a lot is that they reach out to the company and then, you know, typically there's a process where the BDR books the meeting, which is already like, it's just an inbound. And then a salesperson shows up, but they don't really talk that much. And they let somebody like, like you used to be come over and do a lot of the talking. So what is their value? Uh, you know, because again, you mentioned that, you know, the sales engineer can do a lot of the, the heavy lifting and the conversation because they carry the cloud. So where does the kind of the salesperson fits in? Well, I think um, <laughs> from a sales engineer perspective, the salesperson sets the meetings and here's the nose. Uh, and it's hard, man. It's like, I don't know if you've ever been in an actual sales role, but to hear no so many times is just like soul draining. It is. And, and um, uh, I think a lot of us who were on support roles uh, back at the time, but very few of us made a transition into an account rep role, even though the money was a lot stronger. If you could, if you had the resilience, the personality and the resilience and the persistence. Um, and I just knew that if I had to transition into that and just constantly hear no, that, that, um, it would have an effect on me personally. And I didn't, I didn't want to pay that price. It was not worth the extra cash. Um, and so I just, you know, I have to empathize with those guys because it's, it is, um, it is on one hand, you get all the credit because you're the rep and on, and you get the bigger paycheck. And on the other hand, um, when things don't go sideways, it like the measurement is absolute. It's very clear. And if you can't perform two quarters in a row or three quarters in a row, whoever the sales manager is, you're gone. So there's an enormous amount of pressure. It's competitive. And some, a lot, you see a lot of athletes go into sales because of the competitive nature and because of the immediate reward. It's like, you know, you uh, score a touchdown or you, um, you know, put a, a ball three inches from the hole on the, on, the, on the golf course or something like that. And there's this, again, it's an adrenaline rush. Now you get the same thing in sales for sure. So, yeah, I, I, yeah, I, 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 yeah, I have a ton of respect for, for these guys. These, uh, they call them the Eagles or the Rainmakers or whatever. Man, like the, the, they're really, really good at their craft. And if we're honest, what they're doing is not that different from what we're doing. We're trying to influence outcomes. No CISO out there has the, has the budget or the control. Um, every, every one of us has to get things done through influence. And that's the, it's the same game for those guys. So you see a lot of CISOs burning out and it's because their influence game sucks. I mean, in some cases, not all cases, there's obviously, I don't want to make it sound like that's the only reason why people, you know, no, burning out. And, and I think the, the, the entire economy is driven by someone convincing and influencing someone else to do something, you know, whether it's to buy something or make a decision, it's a, it's a 360 and you end up selling to your board. You end up selling to your peers, you end up selling to your, even the people that report to you, if you can, you know, become that leader and what is leadership? Leadership is convincing that you are the right person to, to lead. And so it's, it's a, it's a 360, you know, selling all around. And that's why I think, you know, you, you're right. Um, I don't think the, you know, the sales profession gets enough credit and some, some people will say, you know, they almost feel not ashamed. It's not maybe the word, but they're not comfortable saying, "Oh, I'm a salesperson." Even though, despite oh the God. fact that the entire that was me, entire the car, entire economy is based on, and that's what people don't realize: the fact you even get a paycheck. It, don't, it doesn't matter who you work for. There's somebody out there that generates 
you know, generates that, that revenue. And you have to have that. Otherwise your paycheck is, you know, in, in our world, it's not, you're not going to get it every two weeks. And I think a lot of people yeah, have yeah, that yeah. disconnect. You, you, you said the comment, people hesitate to uh, admit they're a salesperson. When I was in the role at Fishnet, um, you, you know, you have to do an intro in every one of these calls. And, and the, met, the math basically said, if I don't have at least seven calls a day, uh, seven calls a week with qualified on-site calls with qualified customers, then I don't hit my number. That's basically what it said. And I knew that some number of these calls were not going to be qualified because some reps are better than others. Um, and I had to introduce myself in every one of those meetings. And I will tell you, um, I would have this dr- sinking feeling in my gut uh, every time because I was a salesperson and I didn't want to admit that. And finally, when I um, when I read that book, uh, Let's Get Real or Let's Not Play, and I transformed my way of thinking about what is my role, why am I here, what am I doing in the room, um, I had a much easier time introducing myself and having the conversation and feeling okay because I felt like I um, like I was uh, turning my back on my technical roots and like. Um, you know, you can just feel it. People, you walk, as a salesperson, you walk in the room, and people. I've had direct peers say, "All salespeople are liars and uh, cheats, and they're just out to line their pockets." And so, um, when people feel that way, the way they treat you also gets reflected through microaggressions and other things. So, yeah, man, that, that, the it's it's really interesting for you know, stirring up all kinds of stuff inside of me from those days. So. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and and I think you're right. You know, getting getting so many no's. I think this. It's almost like after a while, they getting they get all get burnt out. They, it's almost like they have uh, you know PTSD that's related to to being in the trenches, literally in the trenches for so many years. And and it's you know and realize you know and experience the adversity of of trying to get revenue in the door. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It's funny because, you know, it has as much to do with the team sell as it, uh, anything. And I don't know if um, all sales people really recognize this, but sort of stand, standing back and watching the guys who were really successful and the guys who struggled, um, the people who were really successful ended up having uh, other players really support them. And they had this huge organizational support. And I watched reps from different vendors be very successful with one vendor and leave and really struggled to do anything on a, in a better a better company with better technology because they didn't have the community of support behind them. Um, they didn't have the legal team wasn't expired to respond quickly and the, they were not using the best uh, SEs and other things like that. And so you would see their incomes uh, get cut and you could see that they were panicking because they just bought a boat and they thought they were going to do even better at this new company with better tech. And, um, yeah, you could see, like, the you know, sweat and bullets and stuff. I mean, that, that was all very real. <clears throat> and, and the reason I think they, they failed at that is because they did not succeed in selling internally who they are yeah, and yeah, what yeah. can they bring to the table. Yeah, and that's, that's not that's different than a CISO role, right? Like uh, Malcolm uh, Harkins talks about in his book, um, he talks about uh, the, the battlefield, the internal battlefield. Uh, and the external battlefield. The external battlefield being, how do I do all the protection uh, against the hackers and the threat landscape and all that stuff? And the internal battlefield is the, he, he, he calls out three Bs, I forget what they are, budgets, bureaucracy, and there's another B, I always forget what the other B is, but yeah, uh, very much the same. If you don't have that uh, support to facilitate your success as a CISO, just like a sales rep, you're not gonna be successful. And that leads me to the, so you know, you're so well read, why did you decide to to co-write the CISO evolution with uh, Rock Lambrus? This is something that you kind of launched recently, and uh, you obviously saw a gap. And it's 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 like being an entrepreneur, right? A lot of entrepreneurs seeing that there's something out there that's missing, and it's potentially through their own experiences, while they're you know doing something else. And I, I'm assuming that's what happened to you here. Yeah, I. I would go to, so at some point when I was younger and I didn't have a kid, um, I would go to, to everything. Uh, with Rocky Mountain InfoSec, ISSI, um, uh, the Internet Users Group, um, 
a wasp. Um, I was at everything. I went to everything. Um, and you would hear again and again and again, and we address this kind of in the interlude or the, the, the intro to the book, um, people say, you've got to talk to the business in business language. And so then I would go up and ask these people after the conference or the conversation or the presentation or whatever, hey, what does that mean? Like, give me an example. How does that work? Like, how do I go from, I don't have business language. I'm a guy who was writing code and I don't know business language, so how do I do it? So I had this big, long debate um, with my wife. We, we saved and saved and saved, and we finally we got to the point where we were going to, um, where I could either afford to do an MBA or we could do a round-the-world trip. And so we, we opted to sell everything um, and uh, live in a double-wide split, actually, a double-wide with uh, another person. Um, and then after uh, a year, while making the most money I had ever made as a salesperson, um, we ended up doing a 15-mile round-the-world trip. Uh, and then I came back, and I still wanted to do uh, the MBA. And so that's when I finally decided to sign up for the MBA. And after doing the MBA, there would be moments in each of these di different uh, topics, you know, your supply chain course or your, what, you know, your uh, finance course or your managerial statistics course or whatever, where I would think to myself, oh, that's how you do it. This is an opportunity for the CISO to elevate the discussion and bring business context. Um, and so I started making notes. And if you look on my LinkedIn, um, right after I had a blog that uh, basically said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this um, series of blogs where I'm just going to talk about each of these different courses. So that had been sitting for, I don't know, five or six years, and I still, I just never got to it. I think I wrote two, two of them, and then Rock and I were at this, uh, yeah, go ahead. The, this, no, it comes back to, to my point is, like, it's much easier for someone to just have a conversation about it as opposed to, to write these blogs. And I think now the way people consume, like you mentioned, you have, uh, you know, your young kid is like they're growing up, they're just watching stuff, listening to stuff, this, this uh, you know, and I think we have to convert some of these, uh, you know, even your book, that's why we're doing this today. We're going to discuss some of the, some of the topics. Uh, so basically convert these blog posts into, or kind of redirected them into a, uh, a written book, right? Yeah. I mean, it, look, I, I can't leave out uh, the importance of rock who um, either had the uh, ignorance or the courage to really push us to do this and the, and the ambition because without him, it doesn't get done. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and he split the work and we, we both had MBAs and we said, well, let's carve it up. And I picked the topics that, that I was most passionate about. And it, he and I are such opposites in every possible way that um, that worked out well. So he wanted to talk about all the soft, squishy stuff. And I wanted to talk about the edgy sort of innovative um, uh, use of things like statistics and finance and whatever, and valuation. Um, yeah, and then uh, and then we had other support too. Rich Syerson gave us intros to our uh, publisher Wiley, and Wiley has been uh, really good. You know, I mean, they they have gotten us um, in front of every possible sales uh, channel that you could get, and we could have gone the route that like Gary Hayslip and others went, where they self published and then self promoted. Um, so I don't know. Uh, we we've had a lot of really good supporters. And you know, I have to. I had the great pleasure to to interview Rock, and uh, he's. Oh, cool. he's, Yeah, you're right. He's he is. You know, you can just tell he's very different than you. Like just uh, just in terms of uh, even how he carries himself. Uh, you yeah. know, and, and not in a bad way. Just just different. And so, tell me a bit about the book itself. It's it's. You mentioned it's divided kind of into two sections, and there are different chapters. Um, you know, how should be read as a as a reference book, or who's well, you know, maybe like. Talk to me about the kind of the the audience and how it should be read and what's kind of the key takeaways. Uh, well, the audience was intended for cybersecurity leadership, but like you mentioned, we've actually had a number of uh, sales folks uh, leverage the book to gain empathy and understanding about kind of just what happens in the role. Um, so, so it is actually three sections: it's uh, fundamental business knowledge, uh, communications, and leadership. And uh, we split the chapters down the middle. 
so I wrote the first five or six chap- five chapters. I think Rock wrote the next few, and then I wrote the last chapter on negotiation. Um, yeah, we, each um, chapter is kind of carved up. So we provide what we think is the opportunity, and we frame it up using storytelling in most cases. Um, so that you can really understand. And that's where maybe some of our personality and storytelling comes through. So those those are probably easier pages to read. Then we offer um, the theory. So you can, you know, contemplate like, okay, so here's this opportunity and here's the theory that we're going to apply in order to potentially exploit this opportunity. And then we wrap it up with um, a, a series of case studies that are real valid case studies that have occurred inside of our uh, careers with very tangible um actionable things that you can implement in your career. And then, uh, of course, we do like the key insights or whatever. So, yeah, that's the structure of the book. Um, and and um, how is it meant to be read? We, um, we, so originally what we set out to do was to say, you don't need an MBA. Instead of spending 100 grand on an MBA, read this book. That was the, like, that was why we wrote the book. And, um, and there are different, um, areas and exposure that different people will have. And so what we h- hoped to be able to do was to allow people to read each chapter independently. So um, if you're struggling to connect to your business, at least understand the business model. So there's a chapter that has a use case and a, a demonstrates business models and how to map them. Um, uh, understand how to read your financial report and understand um, how your company is valued. So we walk through those three topics. If you're struggling to um, secure the budget that you need, there's a chapter on business cases. Um, There's a chapter on uh, communication and influencing. There's a chapter on COSO and um, storytelling. So those would be kind of more of the central themes that I would gravitate to if I was trying to pick those out. And I think in the introduction, we we at least highlight with enough detail um, that a you know somebody who's paying attention is going to look at things and probably pick up the book and migrate directly to a particular chapter. Um, to be fair, I think you probably need the foundational business knowledge to really extract the full value out of the later chapters. So you probably need those um, to be read. And to be fair, if you dive into some of the work that Rock did on mapping out COSO and tying that to a larger enterprise risk framework, if you skip the front end of those chapters, then you're probably going to struggle on the last uh, few chapters. Um, But uh, I would hope that you could pick up each chapter and um, read it independently and and get some, you know, meaningful insights out of it. And as somebody who's who's done the MBA as well, you know, I, I can tell you that I think that the, you know, you do an MBA, and you, you, you know, you do all those case, you know, case studies and, and then it's sometimes it's hard to, to figure out how to apply that because a lot of times the, you know, the cases you talk, you like you look at the Procter and Gamble or you do Gantt charts and all kind of like, uh, you know, like things that are very, you know, like almost a pie in the sky type of thing. And then you come to the day to day operations and you come across things that are, okay, how do I take the, and you know, you're nodding. So maybe I'll, I'll let you speak. Maybe like, how do you solve that? That kind of, you know, the, the lofty MBA on one side and then the day to day kind of grind sometimes to, to get things done. Uh, a problem, uh, what is it? A problem well defined is a problem half solved. Um, I think that you're right. The MBA case studies, um, they present all of the pertinent facts and maybe a couple of distracting facts and they package it up and it's really nice thing. But um, the reality is that when you're in the midst of the whirlwind, um, which, which, which is a specific reference to the four disciplines of execution, um, when you're in the midst of the whirlwind, um, it's hard to separate out what uh, things are really important uh, or germane to or even sort of root caused and influencing the current situation, right? So it's not always apparent uh, to me, for example, a person who's very analytical, but maybe lacks um, the emotional intelligence uh, or the self-awareness to really um, 
to really capture or be aware of, you know, maybe not, now is not the right time for me to say this, or maybe, um, maybe, uh, uh oh, maybe, uh, sorry, my son is here. Um, maybe, uh, so let's talk a bit about, um, so you, you again, just even, even the fact that you went kind of did a, a world tour, I mean, that's, that's not trivial. You ended up, um, and, and it's by itself is, is gives you an additional layer of being more round individual and have a greater appreciation to various different cultures. And I think again, for, for us as in the U S and just, a in, uh, in North America in general, we, I think we're very, uh, centric, right? So mm-hmm. we always talk about diversity and, and so on. And, and, you know, the fact that it, it uh, provides additional power as an organization. Uh, you know, do you find what would be like kind of the key takeaways from you, like traveling and then, and then talk to me about where you are today and how we're having this conversation. You, uh, you mentioned Starlink before we started, uh, having it, and that would be of interest to, I think a lot of people as well. Yeah. Gosh, what would be the big takeaways? Well, at some point I did write a blog, uh, for a travel uh, organization and I wrote about the, uh, benefits of travel to us, to us, to any executive. So I probably should reference that. I don't remember what I said. Um, I mean, <laughs> you the, the, the flashbacks. Yeah. The, the thing that really stands out for me is, um, the, there's an exercise that you do where you say, what are the things that you would need if you were going to survive? And depending on, uh, the culture that you come from and the things that you've been exposed to, you might select very dramatically different things. So, uh, for example, if you lived in the rainforest in Costa Rica, the things that you would bring to mind that you need to survive would be quite different than if you're in a semi-arid um, uh, or very arid mountainous uh, area like like where I am here in Mexico now. Um, and so... I, I think um, just the idea of having been to the different areas and seen 10 different ways that people make coffee uh, or having seen um, uh, the, the different manners in which uh, homes are constructed or the different materials that people use or the different approaches to waste management uh, or the different approaches to, um, to commerce uh, and frankly, the availability or not of a central banking system and uh, all kinds of, you know, sort of broad uh, systems. And then I think you also being exposed to larger, broader um, world events throughout history. So you can't go to Cambodia without uh, hearing about Pol Pot and the genocide that took place there. And you obviously you can't go through uh, Germany without experiencing the wall and thinking and talk, talking about those experiences um, uh, and, and the similar story, like there's all kinds of Soviet influence and, and, and impact on uh, all of the different places throughout Eastern Europe. Um, so, so I think uh, all of that has an impact on the way that you frame problems and the way that you think about things. And it maybe for me, it challenged me to look at things uh, from a much more broad perspective. I think at the time when we did the travel, I was super into exploring um, religion. And so I spent a lot of time uh, reading about different religions. I spent a bunch of time in the Bhagavad Gita and, and, and read a bunch about um, uh, Buddha and went to um, his birthplace. And we, you know, did a yoga teacher training and a handful of other things just for the exposure to um, a more Eastern mentality. Um, and then I think we did, like we did um, three months of <clears throat> language study in, in Beijing and we lived in the second ring road and we visited, you know, all the way out to the seventh ring road and just experiencing like getting in the subway and seeing what it's like in the center of Beijing and what it's like on the outskirts of Beijing. Um, just gives you, gives you a real appreciation for the, even the disparity in class systems inside of, a um, you know, cultures outside of your own. Yeah, man. You know, I, I hear you speaking. All I can think about is the, the uh, you know, the Saki commercial, the most interesting man in the world. You know, like how <laughs> you've, you've, you've done all those things. And again, it's just, uh, 
it, it truly is amazing. And it, also, it's amazing that you take like all those experiences and you apply them in, su- in some way to our, to our discipline. You yeah, know, like the, the I mean, that's discipline. true. Not, not, it's not like it's some, I mean, I think that's true of all people, right? You take your personal right. experiences and you, and you intentionally apply them. I think, um, I've done a bunch of personality studies and I, there are some things that I do better than some other folks. Um, so I think one of the things that I do is pattern recognize and, and, and I'm, um, able to then bring those patterns and, and communicate those. So on one hand, that's good. On the other hand, uh, I have a lot less talent and things come not easy to me. So I have just grinded out things, um, more than anything. And I think that's true of a lot of, like, if you look at UFC fighters, there are naturally talented people and there are people who are very, uh, gifted and can articulate. You think about John Jones or, um, DC and Daniel Cormier Jones beat DC a couple of times and he's all talent. Um, uh, whereas DC is out, you know, training kids and able to do his detailed shows and articulate exactly what people are doing and why and how this has an impact on the broader um, game. So I don't know. I, I think um, obviously both have their merits. Yeah, but it, it's it's yeah. You mentioned though that that you, you have to have a little bit of both, and I think that the like the talent and the ability to to uh, to make the effort and you you did. It shows in the, in the whole journey, your journey that you, you know, like just not even the academia, but all the stuff that you've done that you did definitely put in the effort. And uh, <laughs> I think you're just being humble as well about the, the talent. Hey, so quick question for you. So you are now in, in Mexico and we are having this communication through the Starlink. Um, and again, I think that's with, with the world becoming more, you know, decentralized if you wish and people are moving from you know the becoming digital nomads you know what was that experience like because uh, you know we're having this conversation and but you are in a very remote area of mexico um you know first why why did you make the decision to to move there uh and then what was the experience like to, to set the system like that up um well my son is um being raised bilingual and he um, uh, won't have uh, forever to have a lot of exposure to his grandparents uh, who are uh, thankfully in good health today. And so um, this is one of the more remote places that we've had the opportunity to go, believe it or not. Uh, And um, I wanted him exposed to his heritage in a very tangible way. I wanted um, I wanted him to be able to walk around the town and to have his mom tell him, when I was six, that's the um, faucet that I would go and bring water uh, back to the house from. Um, Or this is the river, and you can see that the houses used to be down closer by the river, and the reconstruction of the town brought the the, the entire town up. Or this is how a gravity-fed water system uh, functions, and... Um, and, uh, and, and there's lots of other benefits. His, uh, his grandfather is, uh, um, uh, a farmer, uh, runs, uh, about 80 cattle, I think down here. And, um, and you know, there's cows and chickens and uh, all kinds of things going on here that just don't happen in the streets of Brooklyn. And so creating that kind of awareness and context of, uh, privilege and opportunity, um, and also just kind of expanding his exposure so that he can um, have a more robust set of experiences to draw from when he's problem solving throughout his life, I think was really important. Um, so ever, that was part of it. To, yeah. Matt, quick question. Did he ever have to explain to his grandparents what it is that you do? Do I have to? Well, he's only four, no. so he doesn't. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah. But did he, you explain? So I guess the. Because I think that there's such a, on the surface at least, there's such a you know such a gap between what do they do and then what you do, from a from a technology. They're they're very low tech, and then you you are on the other side of the spectrum. Yeah, there's definitely been a handful of questions like, what do you do all day? Because you know there's 20 people in, full time in this town population, um, and of course you. Uh, not like in New York, you you don't make eye contact and you stare at the ground when you 
walk past people and it would be totally impractical to, 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 to pause and have a conversation with every person in town. But if you avoid eye contact or don't say hello, and basically every time that you encounter someone here, uh, you would probably be considered rude. Um, yeah, th there have been questions from the little kids in town to say, how can you work all day inside? They don't, like, the concept is very uh, confusing for them. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I think, um, I think that, uh, what, you know, one of the first couple of things that we did down here was install an air conditioner and a uh, heated water, and not everybody has those uh, luxuries here. And it's been 95 degrees uh, for the last two weeks down here. So, yeah, there's, there's, there's quite a contrast, I think. And, and then technology is advanced if you are able to do that. You have to be able to work inside in such a remote area. So Starlink is something you applied for way ahead in advance, right? And you see, how was that experience? What, what is it you, you, you get? You get like a box? Like, you know, how does it, how does that work? Yeah, I could do the unboxing ceremony. I actually still have a box sitting right there. Um, we, so look, first, in, in order to order um, in a foreign country, so, so I think that um, what's true is they have made the <clears throat> cost of the hardware and the subscription affordable for each of the economies and not all economies are equivalent so the cost to run Starlink in Brooklyn is different than the cost to run it here um, we're in a town that doesn't have street names or street numbers and the Mexican government doesn't deliver here so we had to um, have our Starlink delivered to uh, other relatives and my wife's Mexican so so we had the opportunity to do that um, you you actually have to have a uh, the equivalent of a, a Mexican social security number in order to order Starlink in a, a foreign country like this. Um, and then they also set up and how you specify the exact GPS locations. And I, I'm not clear as to whether you, you could or could not operate the Starlink satellite once you've got it and from a different location. Um, clearly, so they would you be able to geofence it. Yeah, I don't know if they do or they don't. Um, certainly, like my CTO um, has Starlink and Powerwall uh, uh, as well, and his Starlink is um, on his boat. And so I think um, uh, that obviously there are roaming versions of Starlink, and I don't know if those subscriptions come with different fees or if that hardware uh, operates differently. Um, but in, in this case, uh, yeah, we you register... Once you finally, we had to actually go through a full process of getting the IDs to have the number to be able to be eligible and then order it shipped to a relative's house because we couldn't get it here and then go to that town and pick it up. So there was some extra steps involved for, for, for us to get the internet kind of up and configured out here. Um, and we could have used a local uh, internet provider. The speeds are much higher um, and, um, and we're not bound to some kind of constraints. Like in, in this uh, particular town, there are two towers that are tied to solar. And so um, last year when we came, we, we uh, borrowed internet from one of the guys up the street. Um, but if the, it was cloudy, the internet didn't work, uh, which is clearly not practical. You can't call in and say, I can't work today because it's cloudy. Um, and uh, That'll be the, the first, other thing, by the way. yeah. yeah. Right, and 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 uh, and the other thing is um, because they're solar paneled, it takes a certain amount of time in the morning. So there's a limit to how early you can start working, and it's earlier. You know, to get started at ten in New York, you have to get started much earlier here. And so we were right at the cusp of um, being able to work. And some days, like your first meeting, you just miss. Um, so those were the, probably the real drivers. Where we wanted a more uh, a more reliable source. Um, in order to be down here and just to be able to extend the opportunity for our let go to have a, a exposure to um, to his grandparents and to his heritage. And do you find, the, I'm, I'm assuming there's latencies associated with the, because of satellite that has a certain amount of time to go up and then go down? If you no, it's population. fast. Every now and then, like, I don't know if we'll experience it here, but every now and then you get a... Um, <laughs> Tell you this and then i'll tell you the other thing every now and then um you get like a 30 second gap or a blip in the conversation like something queued up and i'm not exactly sure why that happens but that's kind of been a repeat experience um 
the other day there was a thunderstorm that came through that blew out a transformer in a different town that caused our power to go down. And of course, without uh, an independent power source, we were stuck. So I ended up scrambling uh, during a half day event <laughs> to uh, get my first generator up and the first generator was vibrating too much and vibrated the plug out and killed the internet again. So we ended up getting a second generator um, and uh, that seemed to work for the rest of the day. So, you know, there's some other things like we'll probably look at the potential for solar and potentially power, like like a, like the power wall or some other kind of clean independent source. Um, I'm also super concerned that we've got this thing plugged into this power, but I don't know whether there's going to be spikes or brownouts uh, over an extended period of time. And if you damage the equipment, I mean, it's not like there's going to be an immediate uh, router replacement opportunity, right? So that would put an end to um, potentially my work week because it'd take at least three or four days to get out of here. You just have to get another one. Have like a failover, right? A backup and that to another to like a search totally. or some sort. Of. And, and yeah. this is what you just described. It's really interesting. Again, this is problem solving. You know, where you just uh, went through, uh, it's just a process of elimination and figure out, you know, how to how to solve all those issues. And, and that can be applied any anywhere in life, right? So from cybersecurity issues to to management to everything else. And and uh, and I think that's something we don't teach enough at school. I think that the problem solving of, of again, just to mention that you have to plug in a generator and it kind of shakes, that not something that you can almost even simulate unless you had to experience that. Um, and it's almost endless, endless number of problems that come come across. I think, I think the curriculum and even in MBA, MBA, right? So they they don't necessarily teach you to how to solve issues. They are more of a you know academic uh, theory type of thing. But in real life, um, and then I think that's also again from from the younger generation, like playing a lot of the the video games, uh, in the video games, there's only a limited number of problems you can solve. Um, hmm. and it's, it's very almost synthetic in a sense, but, uh, you know, the, you know, you mentioned that the kinetic issues of connecting good connectivity and the sun and so on, is something that you can only experience if, if you actually do that. Um, and, and, and again, I'll, I think you're now exposed. I'll to take this all the way to, back to, you know, you think about cyber risk quantification, right? Um, a lot of these cyber risk models, end up coming up with a series or a set of scenarios. And um, inherently, the way that you do cyber quantification um, can be influenced by the model that you build. And that model, so all models are wrong. Some are more useful than others. I think that's a, a Doug Hubbard uh, or a Rich Syerson quote. And, and, and so when you start to do this quantification approach um, and you limit the different models that you have, just like you said, you, you synthetically uh, impair the number of potential outcomes, then you're going to inherently bias your, your model in a particular direction, either too much risk or not enough risk, uh, not enough variability or um, o overconfidence in um, the number that you present. If you're you know, saying we have a 95% confidence interval that there's a you know, 24% chance that there will be a breach in the next three years or something like that. Maybe your confidence is too high. So yeah, all of those same concepts, uh, uh, synthetically, like you said, limiting the potential options are immediately applicable to the cyber risk quant um, story. It's, it's yeah, it's, cool it's analogy. It's super interesting, really super interesting. And uh, Matt, I, I would love to do this more often because it's just, uh, it seems like we're going tangent and I had so many things that I wanted to talk to you about today, but we didn't get a chance to. And uh, so maybe we'll do, we'll table another another time to, to chat. We'll have a couple of episodes and I'll, I'll maybe like just even uh, cover some other topics that you experience and have some, some insight on. Uh, but between now and then, I'd love to, you know, if, what's the easiest way for people to reach out to you for, for anything just from, from you, know, uh, you know, getting connected to you or talking about some experiences to, to advisory or, or whatnot, what's the easiest way? Um, the best way is this to hit up uh, www.cisoevolution.com. Um, you can get a quick browse on the book. Uh, there's links to it in Amazon. Um, so that's to source the book. Of course, it, the book is available in Apple and uh, Audible and all of the places because we, you know, we leveraged a, a, a top-tier publisher. 
Um, and then also on that, there's direct links to both Rock uh, and myself from a um, LinkedIn perspective. So you can connect with me on LinkedIn. I'm more active on LinkedIn. You'll, if you look at my Twitter, you'll notice that it's uh, basically dead. <laughs> uh, and uh, um, yeah, I'm pretty responsive uh, on LinkedIn and um, uh, have had a number of re uh, readers and other folks. And we, you know, whatever, whether it's mentorship or questions on the book or uh, just ideation, um, happy to participate uh, with the listeners in, in, in all of those capacities. Um, uh, just have a little patience with me because there's a lot going on. And um, yeah, CISOevolution.com. Awesome. And then we should definitely do one with Rock, maybe like a joint one where we go on and, and talk about things because he's got a, like a, an amazing perspective as well. Um, we should definitely table some of that. And uh, and it's just amazing to be able to talk to you at the, you know, the other side. Um, you know, and, and maybe we'll, we'll do one with you. Uh, I don't know, you get like a stronger router, maybe do a quick tour of the outside. Um, just uh, when we're, we're having this conversation. And again, uh, thank you so much to, to provide the time today. Much, much appreciated. I really enjoyed the conversation. Um, and I, I'm sure the audience would, would uh, too as well. And until until then, thank you again and looking forward to uh, seeing you all in the next episode. Um, mm -hmm. Safe. Right, I appreciate it. Online. Sounds great. Appreciate online. it. I had fun too. Yeah. Offline. Take care.